You're eternal beings. Do you realize that? <clears throat> We're not waiting for eternity or eternal life to be given to us. It is ours right now. <clears throat> and when this mortal body shall be put off, we shall gain immortality. So it's not something that we are going to enter into. It is something we have entered into, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So isn't that worth smiling about? Great. I wonder, could somebody just bring that board over and a uh, pen for me? I want to just take a little time this morning and... Uh... Thank you, Phil. You know, one of the, um, not that I endorse this man's ministry or who he is, because he was involved in the occult, but boy, he knew a thing or two, and that is why he is touted today as one of the greatest minds when it comes to the human mind. His name is Carl Jung. You have ever had anything to do with or understood or been taught psychology, you will understand this is the man now that is touted as the number one man concerning psychology and psychoanalysis in the world. You cannot go through psychology or any psychoanalytical training without that name being quoted, but if you know his history, you will understand that he spent 13 years in a commune in India, and he was the one that actually spent his life studying the swastika, and when he came out of Hinduism, he brought it and introduced it to Hitler, and he was the mind and the brain and the occultic influence behind Hitler. And alongside of him, there was a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger, who founded and started the Sanger Institute. And uh, she is the one that will always, if you ever see a cavalcade or a photo of Hitler, you will see this slender, very slim, petite woman standing beside him. Her name is Margaret Sanger. She is the one who was American but then fled and after the war moved to Canada, started up what is known as Planned Parenthood. And she is the one that was behind the whole occultic study of eugenics. What is eugenics? It's euthanasia and reducing and limiting the Earth's population. And that's the woman and people talk about the abortion issue and they think it's a legitimate stance. It was started and promoted and funded and is driven by Planned Parenthood in the United States of America. Its former name was the Eugenics Society, Margaret Sanger. Carl Jung stated and said this, let me quote it to you directly. He said, the source, the source of all mental illness is the avoidance of legitimate suffering. Let me say that again. The foundation of all mental illness is the avoidance of legitimate suffering. What does that mean? It is suggesting that we will do anything to avoid challenges in life that will bring personal pain. We will avoid it at all costs, and then as a result of it, that has an outworking in our physical body and our physical, or should I say, our understanding. I want to just begin to draw something to you or for you. Should we have a cleaner? Yeah. And it's concerning the mind. I was taught psychology when I did my theology many, many years ago, back in 1965. And I was forced to go through this understanding of the basis of psychology. I don't put any weight upon it because I think that it might give you a bit of knowledge, but it doesn't give you an answer, and it doesn't give you any way out. It just helps you understand what goes on in your brain. And so the thing that I have encountered as I have journeyed through the world on many occasions, I have sat with the third highest psychologist and psychoanalyst in the world, and I've had the opportunity of debating many of them concerning the Word of God. And I say the thing 
that I understand about psychology and psychoanalysis is you can tell a person the problem, but you don't have an answer. And the answer is simple, really. Very simple. And if you learn to begin to implement the Word of God and superimpose it over your mind, you will resolve mental conflict. If somebody would like to take this scripture and read it back for me, please. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. While you're doing that or looking for that, I have some other scriptures that I was just a lot of different ones just fired back at me. I want to tell you the story. True story of a man one day that hopped on an underground train heading from New York to a suburb at the close of the evening on a Friday afternoon. And this man had two sons, and his sons were young boys. As the three of them light had got on the, play, uh, on the train, the underground, found their seats. The train was jam-packed full of people returning home from the end of their working day. Most of them were from central New York. Some of them were judges, and in particular one of the ones that actually took it upon himself to act was a Supreme Court judge. And the train was full of um, uh, monetarists and people and uh, returning at the end of their busy week and they had papers and newspapers and books and they were all just sitting there nobody was talking and when this gentleman got on the train with his two sons his sons just wreaked havoc through the tram and through the train as they ran through the paper uh, the, the train ripping the papers out of the people's hands and the the train and the people on it got so enraged but nobody said anything and you could see the anger rising until finally this man who was a Supreme Court judge got up in his anger and his rage and went over to the man and grabbed him on the shoulder and said stand up and the man stood up he said deal with these sons of yours look what they are doing and as the man lifted his head the tears were rolling down his cheeks and the judge saw it and he said what is wrong sir and the man said, I am extremely sorry. I have just come from the hospital as I boarded the train where I have just lost my wife and my two sons have just lost a mother. The gentleman who wrote the story in the encounter of this and was published in many magazines said the whole spirit of the train changed in a moment of time. And the whole spirit just suddenly turned from one of anger and rage to one of compassion and mercy and suddenly everybody was putting their hand in their pocket to try and offer help to rectify what they saw was a mood of anger and rage i tell that story to tell you this if I have learned anything in my journey of 45 years of pastoring, I've learned this, that everybody has a story to tell. Everyone. All you need to do is push the right buttons. Some will not relate this story easily because it's too deep, it's too wounding, it's too hurtful. Others, because they are people that are open and trying to find an answer, will immediately pour out this story. We're all different. But I have found every man has a story. And if I was to push the right button in your life today, your story would come out. And just like my story, yours has relevance to your life. And your story has pain, has understanding, has concern, but above all of that is many questions. A troubled mind. You may have seen this before, but if you understand that an iceberg, when it sits in the water, below the surface of the water, 90% of the mass of that iceberg is underneath. That's what caused the problem when the Titanic went down. They didn't realize 
when the ship's hull hit the iceberg that it spread out way in deep underneath the actual surface of the water. So an iceberg has 10% above, has 90% below. Do you know the human mind is the same? The human mind is made up of two parts. And those two parts are known as the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. Ten percent of it is what you think with every day. Ten percent of it is in the forward cortex of your brain, from which you act, and the motor part of your brain is acted by the conscious part of your thinking. But when you are in a difficulty, and when you are in a crisis, and you don't know what to do, your education and your training through the years has built a memory bank called the subconscious mind, the subconscious beneath the surface, underneath, and the conscious mind will draw back into the subconscious, and out of the subconscious, instant recall will come. And in a moment, when you're about to hit a car, all the training of your life from the days of a child till that moment of time will cause you to respond in an instant and you know what to do. You didn't think about it. Where did it come from? Your subconscious mind. Because it's all stored in there and the memories of everything you have ever been through equips you so that your conscious daily activity draws upon historic reactions and experiences to help you negotiate through life. This is very significant because 90% of your mind, your brain, is under the surface. Under the surface of what? It is sub-under. It's the Greek word. Under what? It is submerged in the spirit world. Now, if you understand the scriptures, as I will open them up, you will understand that it's into this area of your brain comes both an external form of influence. Two forms of influence. Because your subconscious mind is submersed in the spirit world, is under, that's where you begin to dream from. When you are in night and when you are thinking, uh, not thinking actively with the conscious mind, your subconscious mind, your memory bank and your computer is working overtime. And that's where all your dreams, revelations and visitation comes from. Where does that in turn come from? What is the source of that? The source of that is the angelic and the demonic. Why is it that you are walking into a situation and you see a person in a shop and as he puts his hand into his wallet, and he pulls out his wallet, a hundred dollar note falls to the ground, and instantly the guy has not recognized it, and you're standing at the back of the room, and your mind, as good as you are, and as honest a person as you are, and a person of integrity, the first thought comes into your mind is, the guy didn't see it, he doesn't know, let him walk out and pick it up. Where did that thought come from? That's where it comes from. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And it's set to bring us down. But in the instant that you begin to 
get that thought, another thought comes into your mind. And that thought that comes into your mind is, thou shalt not steal. Where did that come from? From here. I have been in situations and I have seen the most amazing things in my journey. Most of it is outside this rationalistic society in which we live. But when you start to travel through third world countries and suddenly the spirit realm begins to open up to you and God opens your eyes to the spirit realm because you're right in the middle of it and you're dealing with witch doctors and all the rest of it, then you begin to see things you never see in a rationalistic society like this. And I've seen them. And if your eyes were opened to see the spirit world, you would understand that there is a, another dimension that operates alongside of ours. And science now has proved and they can film the actual spirit world. They wouldn't call it that. In the military, they refer to it as the metaphysical. Physical and metaphysical. They wouldn't use the terms spirit. In science, neither would they refer to it as spirit. They have different terms again, but the reality of it is, this is what it is. They call it, science calls it, parallel dimension. A dimension of another world alongside ours. Do you know the Greek word parakal, P-A-R-A, K-A-U. And you'll find it in the actual Greek language, and when you pick up the Septuagint and read it, you'll find, for example, here, in this particular scripture. And Sam, Samuel came to King Saul and said to Saul, The Lord has instructed you, Saul, to go and slay Agag, King Agag, and all the Amalekites. Leave none alive. And say, man, that's a brutal God. No, 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 if you understand the story of the fallen angels, the Bible tells us that Agag was of the giants. He was of demonic seed. There was no redeeming this man. God said, you take them all out because they will be a thorn in your side forever. Saul went out, and the Bible says that he slew the Amalekites, but he retained the life of Agag. And he brought him back with all the cattle and everything else that was polluted, and he's going to offer that to God reproach. Samuel comes along and says, who is this? And Saul said, this is Agag. I suffered him to live. Samuel, prophet, carrying a sword, whips out his sword, takes his head off. So you won't do it, I will. And then he begins to bring a prophetic word to King Saul. He says, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, I, the Lord, have rejected you from being king. He didn't reject the word of the Lord. He just rejected what he wanted to. Do you know the word that's used there? It's the word parakal. Para, parallel, walks alongside parallel world, parallel universe. It walks alongside, but forms its own opinion of what it should do and doesn't align with God's. So it determines out of the whole information what it wants to respond to. It means to half hear. That's the literal translation of the word parakal, to half hear. Do you know why the institutions are full today? That is why. Because the conscience begins to prick us because we only half heard and we know in our heart what we do is wrong, but we continue to do it and confusion becomes the result. And then this contention between the spirit world in the angelic and the demonic, the word from the Lord or the word for the temptation from Satan begins to cause this tearing away at our mind and we're caught between two worlds. Do you know what double mindedness means? That's exactly what it means. To be of two minds. And remember the mind, the word for mind is the word suke, and it literally be, it means to have double sources of information living in two worlds. Psalm 
So this is godly, hence good. This is evil, or should I put it the other way around? It's devilish, and therefore it is evil. So we have this war going on in our mind, and it's a daily basis, and that's why the Scripture says put off the world and all the things of it, and put on the mind of Christ. Who found that Scripture for me? Who will read it? Yes, please. And see and ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. You will find rest for your soul. The Greek word, suke, mind. Your mind will not be in turmoil. Seek out the old ways, find the old paths, and you'll find rest for your soul. In other words, do it God's way. I have five scriptures here, or should I say four? If four people would look these scriptures up, and as I call for them, please read them back to me. One is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The next one is Luke chapter 24, verse 38. The next one is Luke chapter 1, verse 29. The final one is 2 Thessalonians to verse 2. So if I can have four people that will seek out those scriptures. Romans 12, 2, Luke 24, 38, Luke 1, 29, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. And I will ask for those in due course. I want to read to, a, to you a poem. You will know this. Very, very old and well-known poem. But I made it basically a challenge of my life to try and live. And if you come to our place, you'll normally find it posted on the back of the toilet door. That's Daphne's doing. But nevertheless, it's an inspiration. Now, I don't necessarily endorse the man because he had some uh, leanings. But however, search for peace in a man's soul, here it is. The poem is just simply entitled, If. If you can keep your head when all about you, they are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, do not deal in lies. Or being hated, don't give way to hating and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts your aim. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two impostors just the same. If you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, and watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and bend again and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing left within you except the will which says to you, hold on! If you can walk and talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with kings and not lose the common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you but none too much. If you can fill the unrelenting minute with 60 seconds of determination and distance, then run. For yours is the earth and everything that is in it. And what is more, you'll be a man, my son. The process of growth and maturity is to deal with those areas. And as I said when I started, every one of us has a story. I don't diminish or demean that story in any sense. But we have to overcome. And in order to overcome, we've got to find a path upward. And the only way you can get on that journey and begin 
to find that path upward is to deal with the attitudes of your heart and spirit. You know it, I know it. And the Bible is very plain concerning this. And if we hold resentment in here, and we allow the demonic to begin to fill this, that is what our conscious mind will draw upon. And our effort to climb higher will always be maligned, undermined, and destroyed by what is in our subconscious. And that is why the Bible says that literally the work of the devil is to destroy us and bring us down through temptation. And that's how the devil speaks into your subconscious. It will come by way of temptation. And the ultimate result will be condemnation. If you go to a court and you are judged and you are then sentenced, you are condemned by the judge. You receive a condemnation, a penalty. His method is temptation. The result is condemnation. God does not work like that. God does not condemn you. In fact, John 3.17 tells us he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him we might have life, a way out. So when the Spirit of the Lord challenges us directly after temptation comes, it comes by conviction. Lord, I'm sorry. You know it. You know it. You don't need anybody to tell you. And you can go out on the street and you can talk to all the people you like about knowing God and they will argue and debate with you and say, I don't believe in God. So what is that in your mind that just brings a sense of justice and right when you do wrong? Where does that come from? I have no idea. Oh, it's in belt. Garbage. Because when you deaden your conscience, it becomes seared like a hot iron. That's what the scripture says and it becomes dead. And you silence your conscience... And the voice of God no longer speaks when you continue doing what you know you should not do. God comes with conviction. And the end result of that is consummation, lifted up. Something comes out of it. A reward. God's methodology is conviction. The result is consummation. Completes his work. And we become better for it. I want to read to you a scripture first. And it's in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10. And it says this, God's speaking, and he actually says the word, and it's mentioned in Ezekiel. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and I will write them in their heart, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be my people. God is saying, I will no longer, when you go back to Ezekiel and read it, write my laws upon tables of stone. I will write them in your heart. The Old Testament they did not have the realm of the Spirit. In the New Testament, if you understand theology, through the new creation, first Adam, the scripture tells us in Romans, was made a living soul, mind. But through the second Adam, Jesus Christ, we are now made a quickened spirit. That's not the word suke. It is the word pneuma, breath of God, where Jesus breathed into them and said, receive the Holy Ghost. It is now written in the new covenant upon our mind and impressed or imposed upon our hearts. And our spirit is alive. And through that spirit, conviction comes and it enlightens the mind and tells us what is the hope of our calling, reminds us of where we're heading, what we are to do, and then out of that conviction that comes from God's spirit to the mind, if we are obedient to it, then the body physically follows and works it out. But if you are not convinced in your mind that this is what you want to do, then there will be conflict. 
and it will be this battle that takes place between this and this. The laws of God are now written upon the fleshy tables of our heart, and we know what is right and what is wrong. And I don't care who that person is, and I've confronted them all over the world from different nationalities, ethnic races and backgrounds, and when you come down to this issue, they know what is right and wrong. I don't care where they come from, darkest Africa, in the mountains of Papua New Guinea, over there and literally May Pen at the top of witchcraft and voodooism in Jamaica. We have been to them, and I'm telling you, every single one of them know what's right and what is wrong. It's written there. They know their interpretation or the spin they put on it might be different. But they cannot devoid and avoid the voice of God. As God uses the conscience and speaks to the mind, which is either the conscious or subconscious. It's called conscience, the word conscience, knowledge. You know what's right and wrong. It's written in our heart. We know in our mind what we should do, but when we choose not to, conflict comes and we then get into difficulty. Go and return to the old paths and find the old ways. Then you'll have rest, peace in your soul, in your mind. I want you to turn in the light of that to Luke chapter 22, verses 54 to 62. And I want you to understand, this is not getting at anyone, because I'm speaking to myself as much as I am speaking to you here, because I've been in this journey for many, many years. And I have struggled, and we have faced some very, very deep valleys, lost a son in ministry, walked away from two house fires and on technicalities the old uh, insurance companies refused to pay out. We've seen tragedies through, through the years and we have literally battled odds. And I know this, I have an enemy. And you can give up like I could give up. But the grace of God has been good for us and God has never allowed us to settle back in our lees and just let bitterness take a hold of our spirit. In face of all the conflict, and I could mention many, many, many of them, because I have a story too, and these people that think that we can walk through life without any trial, I think they're deluded, kidding themselves. The scripture says, let them know who live godly in Christ Jesus, they shall suffer persecution. That's just one of many I can quote to you. There's no easy road. Jesus said that two ways. Do you understand this? They've only just concluded this. The scripture has known it from the beginning of time. That the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, Jeremiah tells us. You say, oh, the heart is just a pump. The Bible says, no, it's not. And suddenly they come to the realization that the same neurons that drive your brain and the cells that are called neurons are the same cells that are in your heart. Your heart is a brain. You know that. They've just concluded that. The same cells that make up the neurons of your brain are exactly the same type of cell that makes up your heart. If you understand the subject and science of core medicine called cellular memory, you will understand what I'm talking about. Those cells are different from all the rest. They have the ability to absorb information. It's like a computer. You can program it. Wow. It's true. If you get on the computer and you'll find that that's true. In the last three weeks, they've just concluded that. So the heart is a brain. It's a memory bank. Out of the heart come the issues of life. And your mind and your heart are tied together. Your brain and your heart are linked. And what your troubled mind does is cause your heart to undergo incredible pressure. If you live in turmoil, it affects your whole being. And in Luke chapter 22... Here's an instance 
of where a man had some struggles like you and I do every day, and, and I say, I'm not trying to get at anyone here, I'm just trying to give some revelation as to understand concerning my own journey and my own battles and what I've found. As I said to you many times, as you know me, understand I spend at least four to six hours a day in the Word. I was born with a photographic memory and nothing escapes my understanding. Not because I'm great, not because I'm any better than anybody else, because I love God's Word more than anything on this earth. And I want to understand. And here is a man, powerful man, but a human man, expressing some of the struggles in his own life, the Apostle Peter. And here in his reactive spirit, because Peter was a reactionary. He was not a passive person. He was an aggressive believer. And the time came when Jesus begins to talk about betrayal. And he says, though they all betray you, I'll never, I'll never betray you. Do you think he was just talking gibberish for the sake of getting a claim? No, that's not where it was at. He personally fully believed what he expressed through his lips. I believe. I'll never let you down, Jesus. But you and I know well that the human side of our frailty, because we are not created righteous, and we are not perfect, has this strife and this battle that goes on in our mind. I will do this. The reality comes and we find we don't do it. There's a struggle, a battle goes on. And worst of all, you don't need anybody else to condemn you. You'll condemn yourself. You'll live with the haunting memory of that thing for the rest of your days. And even though you find and have and receive forgiveness, the enemy will make sure that's highlighted in your brain to the day you die. And you will look back and say, Lord, why did I ever do that? But you can't erase it. It's history. You've got to put it under the blood and walk on. Can you imagine Peter? I'll never forsake you. What happens? They took Jesus and led him, verse 54, and brought him into the high priest's house, and Peter followed afar off. Why? Because he's fearing. He's full of fear. And shame causes us to do that. Follow at a distance. Don't want to get involved. Hold back. So we stand far enough away so that we're not implicated, but close enough to be able to observe what's going on. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them, but certain maid held, beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him. Do you understand the old enemy? Will mark you out? I don't care where you go. You think you might hide. You won't. And this is what she said. This man was also with him. If you understand anything about the demonic and Freemasonry, you would have heard Brian Shaw when he was here talking about what he called BR and NBR. Does anybody remember him making reference to that? There is a plane sitting down in Melbourne. And that private jet will fly anywhere in Australia with the highest warlocks of this country in a moment's time. And they will literally array themselves against any body of people that opposes their agenda. I say warlocks. They know what's going on and they are very, very highly trained and attuned to the spirit world and what you say in secret, they know. It's called NR, uh, sorry, NBR non-budding rod. BR, budding rod. If you understand what that relates to, the budding rod of Aaron was in the Ark of the Covenant. And it had no root, it had no stem, it was not planted, but it actually budded. And when they see that there is a divine link by the Ark of the Covenant from heaven to a body of people anywhere that it is beginning to bud to cause them a, res a reaction or some problems, they will be on that plane and they will set 
in action a group of literal regional warlocks and priests and covens to bring you down and they will subvert, they will insidiously creep in amongst you to bring you down. Now I'm saying things here you've probably never heard before, but that's the truth. A budding rod is somebody who literally, or a group who rises up and begins to create a challenge to them. And I'm telling you, very true, very real. I don't want to concentrate on that right now, but that's what you're up against. You cannot hide. Anybody see that literary documentary just a couple of weeks ago where they connected the actual neurons of the brain to a computer? And as the person, you didn't see that? Some of you did. So I've said this all the way through. People say to me, oh, the devil can't read your mind. Garbage. Don't talk rot. I have been amongst witch doctors, and I operate by a word of knowledge in the prophetic, and I have seen these guys tell people what they're actually thinking. And the people have stood there absolutely amazed. How did he know that? We have all these theories, but most of them are not based in truth and have no knowledge. Do you not think that, that Lucifer, who stood and was the literal archangel that watched over the throne of God, didn't understand how to begin to utilize the gifts of the Spirit? He was the one that represented the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go into that. And I'll tell you, they know. And here, again, just a couple of weeks ago, here is a man, and they tried it not just on one, on many. They put this helmet on his head, and they pulled it on, and it has literal sensor units on certain parts of the cortex of the brain. And as they pulled this cap over his head, switched on a computer, here and television screen and with a set of goggles on this man viewing a screen they were watching what he was looking at in this computer in this room through the goggles and they are looking at what is being registered in his mind on another screen in the next room you saw it? you have no idea what they can do that's only what they tell you. I don't want to go into the military stuff, but I'm telling you right now, the church needs to wake up and realize where it's at. We are so far behind the eight ball. If you want to take a subject, go in, and the military all over the world has been working on this, and I mentioned this 10 years ago. It's called remote viewing. And they know exactly, exactly what is happening in your frame of reference anywhere in the world. And they sit in a room and they can tell you and literally list it down. One of my CDs, I've got all the documents there and shows you how the CI trained them at Stanford Research Institute. It's all there. And in one room down the end of the actual Stanford Research Institute, they are literally giving people a verbal instruction of something to begin to draw. And here down the other room, as they're training their spies, they are saying, concentrate on the men in that room down there, 500 meters away, and draw what you think they are drawing and looking at. And there are the two pictures. Check it out. Colonel David Morehouse, who's the man in charge of what is called PSYOPs Division and the CIA. He's the man. The devil knows exactly what you're thinking and what you're up to. And he will literally use it against you through the power of condemnation. And this is what happened here to bring Peter down. And after a little while, another saw him because Peter denied it and said, I say, woman, I know him not. Verse 58, and after a little while, another saw him and said, thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. 59, and about the space of one hour after another, confidently affirmed saying of oh, a truth this fellow also was with him for he is a galilean and peter said man i am no uh, sorry man i know not what thou sayest and immediately when he spoke the cock crew and the lord turned and looked upon peter and peter remembered the word of the lord how he had said to him before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice and peter went out and wept bitterly I don't know who you are, I don't know your full story, but I know there are times when you get alone and your soul is like me. Things that you regret that you have done in your life and the bitterness of the memory of those things will haunt you till the day you die. Because a deep hurt 
deep betrayal, all sorts of reasons. Because your story is just as relevant to you as mine is to me. But you begin to understand we all have one. And that's why we need to extend grace to one another in order to help one another. Because as Phil said, our duty here is to support and assist and literally carry one another. Bear ye one another's burdens. Galatians. Imagine Peter. Imagine how that thing would weigh upon his spirit to the day he died, went to the grave. He would, if he could do anything, erase the memory of that one thing more than anything else in his life. I'll guarantee it. But you can't. But the Bible tells us God turns those things which were meant for evil and turns them for good. And by them we learn what grief it caused and what not to do again. Can I go so far as to suggest to you, as the Lord began to speak to me one day, and you'll hear me quote this scripture so many times because of the powerful impact of it, that God somehow, he does not create the evil, although I do believe he did. He did. See, you would never know love. Love would have no meaning unless there was a negative thing called hate. And the Bible tells us, God said, I created both good and evil. People say, you didn't. I don't believe that. Because of this here. You would never know goodness unless you were put in a situation where you had the power to choose. We were given a free will. You didn't have evil. The only choice is good. I don't want to get into the theological discussions and ramifications behind this, but let me say this scripture. As the Lord one night began to speak to my spirit, I, t I tell you, I sat there in absolute amazement, just astounded at what I read, and I've read it many times. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, and you've heard me say this scripture. It's talking about the body. It's right in the context. 1 Corinthians 11, the table of the Lord. He said, I hear that there are divisions amongst you, and rightly so, because it is true. However, it is necessary that there be factions, divisions, contentions, even heresies in your midst, so that those which are approved of God might become manifest. What? It is necessary. Weymouth's translation puts it this way and says, it is imperative. There is no other way. It is needful. It is absolutely imperative that there are options that there be divisions, factions. He uses the word seditions, even heresies in your midst, so that those which are approved by God might begin to rise, and you will see as it unfolds, and you will begin to see people take camps, and you will see those who are with you and for you, and those who have an ulterior motive to destroy and demean you. And it's in crisis where it comes out. As I've said to you many times, I have heard this term preached all over the world. I have never heard anybody preach the truth of it yet. Never. Mary has chosen that better part. She's the spiritual one. But Martha, she's demeaned. She's just a little lady and she's just a practical woman. Martha, you're just a servant. You're rubbish. That's the way it's translated. You understand the Greek and you'll realize that is further from the truth than any other doctrine and any other truth I've ever read. The word Mary comes from the Hebrew language and it means bitter, Mara, poisoned water. The word Martha just simply means a mother, a little lady. No illusions about herself of grandeur, just a simple little woman. Jesus was saying, Martha, do not demean yourself because you're concerned about waiting on tables. Come and sit here like Mary, because I want to teach you just as much as I want to teach her, but we put a different spin on it. 
when Martha is rejected and Mary is chosen. When pressure comes, it's a totally different story. Because you read John 10, and it says, When Martha and Mary and their brother, brother Lazarus were sick, verse 1, they sent unto Jesus and said, Come to us, for our brother Lazarus, whom you love, is sick near death. Why did they say, whom you love? Why didn't they say, our brother whom we love is sick? No, no, they were trying to impose guilt upon him so that he would come back from where he was and Jesus just simply said go tell Martha and Mary the sickness is not unto death that Greek language uses word two words for no and this word here is the absolute this will not result in death they had a rhema right there and they didn't believe it so Jesus didn't respond the scripture says after two days more, two days to get them, to get their, their servant to get to Jesus and two days to get back. It says after four days, Jesus said, Lazarus is now dead. Let us return and go unto him. And then the debate, oh, he only sleeps and no, no, he's dead and all the rest of it. Jesus goes, comes to the tomb and he says, where's Martha? Where's Mary? Well, they're not here. They're in the house. Go call them. Seven goes and calls him and says, Jesus is at, the, is at Lazarus's tomb. And he calls for you. Martha gets up and runs out. No inhibition. No bitterness. Mary sat still in the house. The Greek word, kathazomai, with obstinance and bitterness, said, I will not go. He didn't come when I called. I'm not going now, he calls. That's the exact word. Switched off to no way bitterness and truth of the spirit comes out when we're in grief when things have gone wrong and God allows controversy it is necessary imperative there be factions divisions contentions even heresies in your midst necessary we want peace in our church forget it you'll never have it and if you get it you've got a false peace because he's speaking to the church and to the body of Christ, and he said it is necessary there will be division, faction, contention, even heresies to see what comes out. And God will use those things to expose the heart of man. And we're all the same, I'm not pointing a finger at you, because it means the same to me. I've had my struggles. People have done things to me, and I want to forgive, and I fought and battled. And finally God says, you do it. You don't have a choice. You've got to let it go. Let the grace of Christ come to your heart. And so the next time, it becomes a little easier. And you think, Lord, I remember what happened last time. I'm not going to fight you this time. And that's how it happens. And God teaches us to be gracious and loving and caring. I didn't say compromise. No way. I preach exactly what I'm preaching here to governments around the world and people in high places. I don't compromise my word for anyone. But I'm telling you, it's not about compromise. It's a matter of learning to be Christ in the midst of our situation. Feel how God feels. Then you can speak how God speaks. You don't sit with judgment and vindic vindictiveness or nastiness. And we've all had to learn that, every one of us, no exceptions. Do you know Jesus said, it's in the book of Daniel, it's in Matthew 24, it's mentioned again in Luke 21, Mark 13, he said, there shall be distress of nations with perplexity. You know, it's an interesting word, perplexity. Perplexity means troubled minds. Distress will cause people's minds to be troubled and oppressed and in turmoil. And he's talking about the day prior to his coming. Let me just say something. When God shows us and we know in our heart what is right and we don't do it, what happens is we start to question. And when we question the authority or the word of God, then the mind starts to become troubled because we know in our heart that we're doing something that's contrary to the will of God. So perplexity begins. And you can't sleep at night because you know there's something wrong. After a period of time, you forget the issue that caused it, but you no longer can sleep. And you wonder why. It normally goes back, and when you're working with a word of knowledge, you can normally zero in on somebody and say, at such and such a point in their life, this is what happened. And they say, that's right. 
It's true, but they never dealt with it. Perplexity, troubled mind. Can you imagine Peter, the apostle? See, it would begin to slip away from the Lord and grow cold in his faith and in his heart and his love. Guess what? That thing would literally come again to, to his thinking. You don't believe that? I'll show you. When you become troubled in mind, you then begin to take up grievance because you are now in grief for you feel rejected and you feel alienated and you wonder why God is standing at a distance from you and you feel grieved in your heart. So then the reaction of human nature comes out. And we take up issues, we find people that will stand with us and endorse what we feel, we talk, we rubbish others, and we criticize, we condemn. And that's the process. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about me. It's the struggle we go through. We try to justify what's happened. And grief is literally just engulfing our heart and spirit because of the hurt of our story. What happened? And you've got to cut yourself free from it, forsaking those things that lie behind. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I press forth to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. As Daphne and I were sitting on the shores of the Black Sea earlier this year. And there was a Jewish, Messianic Jewish lady, very prominent in Europe. She said, there are two people I want you to see. Would you talk to them? I said, yes, if that's what you want. So we had a meeting, McDonald's of all places. We were sitting down there and we were just sitting and said, this woman here wants to ask you something. The Lord already spoken to me what the issue was. We we're sitting there. I said, madam, let me tell you a story. And I quoted that scripture, Philippians. I said, I see a picture of your life. And I said, I see it's like the old prisoners with a ball and chain. And this ball is so big, and you try to get yourself to the end of that chain, but you can't get any further. And you're held, you're anchored to your past. She began to cry. And she said, have you ever seen my website? I said, what do you mean? I said, no, I have not. She said, it's my testimony. And she said, you go on my website. And she said, the front opening page is that very picture you've just described. Well, I said, well, you better understand what the Lord is saying to you, madam. So we prayed for her. Anchored to our past because of her disappointment, the stories of our life. And I'm telling you, I do not demean them. They are incredibly powerful, and they will anchor us to our past and limit us from literally entering our future. Forsaking those things which lie behind, I then can press forth to the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. You've got to cut it off. You've got to let it go. Forgives in the Greek, as I've said many times to you before, is two words joined together. One is the word apo, and the other is the word luo. Apo luo is one of the words forgiveness. There's three. Each one of those words forgiveness has two words associating with each one. One deals with the physical, one deals with the spiritual, and one deals with the psychological. This one, apo luo, is the one that deals with your physical. Your physical walk, the things that are happening in your physical world. And the words are apo luo. Apo is the word aperture, or the word opening. That's our English translation of it, a door. And the other word is the word luo, it means to set free or unleash. Take the rope off your neck that's strangling you. So you open a door as you lift the rope off somebody else whom you've bound. Not only do you set them free, you set yourself free. That's exactly what it means. Romans 12, 2. Would somebody read that scripture out for me, please? Do not let the world get a hold of you. Again, Weymouth's translation says this. Do not let the world encase you in its mold when you'll become set like concrete. But renew your thinking, change your thinking, so that you might know what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. Ephesians tells us, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In other words, get God's spirit into your thinking, his way of looking at things. 
The next one is Luke chapter 24, verse 38. Somebody read that for me, please. Trouble, heart. The word heart there is the same word in the Greek language for mind, suke. The heart is a brain. He said, when your thinking affects your heart, it's because you are troubled. And your physical being is affected by it. They were journeying down the road to Emmaus, and as they were walking, did not our hearts, were not our hearts troubled within us? And you look at the way they were walking and as they were talking, the actual word that's used there in the Greek language, the same we use in the English, and we say they were discussing the matter of what happened in Jerusalem today. That's not the word that's used in the Greek. The word is the word controverting. Controvert, controversial. They were discussing issues with a rational mode of thinking, trying to debate and excuse what had happened. A controvert, one as they were walking along. One was talking to the other, Cleopas, talking to Peter. You say, Peter? Absolutely it was. Read 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5. It tells you there that the Lord first appeared to Peter, to Peter. And he ran back and told the other apostles that the Lord was alive. And Peter's uncle was Cleopas. And as they were joining away from Jerusalem, where they'd been told to remain, they were debating controversial issues from a negative point of view. They took a negative stance. And then the next scripture says, and their eyes were holden so that they could not see. Their negative rational thinking negated their faith, and they couldn't make head nor tail of what had happened. And Jesus journeys alongside. So what are you discussing? They didn't even recognize me. Any wonder? Because when the two women had gone in, earlier in the chapter to the tomb and they'd seen the angels and came back and said to the disciples, he's alive. These things seemed as foolishness to them and they said, you are mad. You read it. And they refused to believe. Here they are walking the Emmaus Road, debating from a negative point of view all that had happened and all that they'd heard and ah, they were rubbish. And Jesus journeys alongside, their eyes are holding, gripped with unbelief, and the Lord begins to speak to them, takes them through the scriptures from Moses even to that present time and opens the word. And then when he finally sits down with them, their eyes are open. So, wow, how come we didn't see this? And he disappears, you see? Spirit, physical. They saw him in the physical, but their mind refuted the spiritual reality. But when they open to the spirit revelation that it was Jesus, suddenly he disappears from their natural view. Very interesting when you get in and you begin to understand it and read it. The word of God is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. There's nothing there that has no meaning. And they are troubled. And Jesus asked them, why are you troubled? in heart. So that's where it happens. It affects your whole physical being. It locks you into negativity. The next one, please. Luke 1, 29. This is interesting. <clears throat> so the angel came to Mary and told her that she was going to be with child. And the scripture says when she heard these things, she was cast in her mind. Do you understand what the word cast means? If I'm going to make something out of plaster, I make a cast. If I want to hold your leg rigid because you've broken a bone, I make a cast. I make it rigid so that it will hold you to what I have for you. She was cast in her mind, could not believe. Strange, weird. Man, what did he say? I have no idea what he's talking about cast in her mind and wondered what all these things were about rational thinking and all of us struggle with it to some degree I'm a thinker I'm a researcher I love science I understand 
creation. I search for all the things in the scripture. I want to know what the word of God is. I want to understand God. And I give my life to it. But I'm telling you, even that knowledge can sometimes cast you in your thinking. You become rigid. So I say, don't talk to me about people, people and men's opinions. I'm not interested. Bring the word and show it to me in the word. And I'll love it. I'll sit down and I'll debate with it. I'll open it up. I'll tear it apart. And I will research it till I've gone to every nth degree to find out what the word is saying. Because I love the word. Because I love God. That's my passion. Not everybody has to be like me. But I'm saying to you, sometimes your rational thinking can get in the way. Cast in your mind. Very interesting. Now the last one. 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. Would you read that for me, please? Everybody? As if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Do you understand what it's saying? You are not to be soon shaken in mind or, by, or to be troubled. In other words, it's saying the same thing as Romans chapter two, verse, uh, 12, verse 2. You know? That you change your thinking, get a hold of these thoughts and these negative things that literally filter through your brain because they will bring you down. And you've got to know who you are in Christ. We will make mistakes Every one of us will make mistakes. Each one of us have a story and a history. Some of it we would rather forget. We can't do that. You've just got to walk on. And as you walk, you've just got to change your reasoning, your thinking, and bring it into line with what God is saying in his word. You see, the Bible makes it very, very clear, and I don't have enough time to go into this, but I could go into how in 2 Peter 2.8 it talks about Lot, he vexed his righteous soul. There it is. Troubled with the sin that was committed in Sodom and Gomorrah. I could show you scripture after scripture. Troubled in mind, he knew what he was doing and where he was living was wrong, but he put up with it and he just compromised and he allowed that thing to go on. And as a result, perplexed, vexed in his spirit. Because he wouldn't take a stand. So his mind is literally clouded. He's lost that sense of discernment, perception, because he's not walking in the will of God. Over and over again, there are scriptures here that tell us this. Abstain from lust, the scripture says in another portion, because it wars, it creates a battle, a war in our soul. In other words, go God's way. Deal with it. Now, I want to read to you one final scripture as we conclude. And that scripture is the answer to all of this that I said psychology cannot give you. And this scripture, if you understand from which I quoted before, and if you embrace it, I'm telling you it will answer all your questions and will bring you into mental release and peace. Because... If you go back to the old ways, find the ancient paths. It will give you rest for your souls. And boy, if I see one thing happening in the church this day, it's the worry. It's the fear. It's the concern. And it grips our heart. And like Job tells us, I fear to fear. Grip my heart. And the fear came into reality captured me and captivated me, brought me down. God does not want us. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. Here's another one. Whose mind is fixed on thee. The more I think about it, the scriptures is pouring through my head right now. Hmm. Saying the same thing. What is in here that governs your daily life is determined by what you put in here. And if your outer man will not perish, it will grow daily.
Philippians. Let's go to that scripture in chapter 4. <coughs> Read it from verse 1 in context. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy, my crown, stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious and Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. They pull their mind into line. That's what he's saying. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. She's talking, the context is taking care of one another, looking after one another. Rejoice in the Lord, always. And again, I say rejoice. Changing the thinking. Getting this into your mind. The life of the Spirit be your motivator. But you can't do that when your mind is locked in the memories of the past. I know it. You know it. So he says, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Don't be worried about what people think about you. Isn't that a big one? This may sound uncouth. I couldn't hear less anymore what people think about me. Spent my life trying to please, trying to do, trying to speak, trying to act. Because I, like you, wanted acceptance and love. Struggled with so much reject rejection and through my life. And I realize it did nothing for me. Trying to pursue it, trying to get it, trying to earn it. It eluded me, it evaded me even more. And one day the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. Isaiah 53, and he was made of no reputation. And the Lord said to me in prayer, when you stop trying to build your own reputation, I'll give you one that no man can take from you. And that released me. And I say it here, this isn't a moment of time. It took me about six months to work through this. And when the Lord released me from all of that past, I suddenly realized who I was in Christ. Because prior to that time, I really didn't know God as a loving father. I never experienced that. I didn't know what it meant. I knew the terminology. The reality, I didn't. And then one day, God began to speak to me, spoke into my spirit, and began to show me. And he asked me, who are you, Brian? And I quoted my name, I quoted where I lived, and then began to tell him all the things that I had done, because I felt that identified me. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, stop. I didn't ask what you are. I said, who are you? And I realized I knew my name and I knew where I lived. That's all I knew about me. I stood there and I began to cry because I did not have a spiritual identity. I was in God. But then as the people's opinions of who I was in Christ, I don't know what they are. Scriptures that you, I'm the most high God, of the most high God. The wisdom of the Lord dwells in me. I'm a new creation. What do you think about me is irrelevant. I'm not saying it gives me license to trample all over anybody else. That's not what I'm saying. I respect people's opinions and not everybody will like me. I understand that. But however, my identity is not built upon what you determine. I am or am not. So I nothing to do with that. I know who I am in God. And as I walk in the light, as he is in the light. Tell you what. I become that son that God ordained me to be. Let me read on. Let your moderation be known unto all men. In other words... Don't be proud and arrogant, for the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. To put it into one of the other translations, be anxious for nothing. What is anxiety? Troubled mind. Troubled mind. Worry. Fear. Sense of isolation. Loneliness. And that's what the devil builds into our life the memory of all the things that have gone wrong how we're not to trust anybody anymore and he isolates us off and picks us off children of Israel you, you look at it when they journeyed through the wilderness said there was not one weak sick among them but you read in another scripture it says the stragglers are the ones that the enemies picked off the ones that were lagging behind 
There's two things that you read out of that story. One, the rest of the body didn't take care of them and draw them in and shield them. And so they fell back and got picked off. But the second thing is that they allowed themselves to straggle back. And oftentimes because we will not trust people and so we will not lower our guard and make an attempt to be gathered in. I tell you, those are the things that we battle with every day of our life and we need to take understanding from the Word of God. So he said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds. Wow. That's a promise. Incredible promise. And that's God's will for you and for me. Set us free from all this anxiety and fear and worry and all the concerns about the future. Sure, we're living in a torn up world. Sure, we're living in the midst of hate and spite and all of these things. Don't let it affect your spirit because that's the work of the enemy to undermine all of this so that then through this here, you will live in lack rather than the bounty of the world. Because if you walk in faith and you don't worry, the Bible tells us all our needs shall be met out of the abundant riches that are laid up for us, his glory. Now, I'm not talking about you know, this nonsense about prosperity, and we're going to take the world, and we're going to own the world, and we're going to have all the gold in the world. That's junk. God won't give that to most because he knew it, and he knows it will destroy us. It's a joke. But he'll give you what you need. And you'll never go without because you're his son, you're his daughter. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. So he gives you a final summation, a close, if you like, at the end of all this chapter. And this is what he says. Finally, my brethren, look what it is. Whatever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or any praise, think on those things. And the summation of our story is both good and bad, hurts, disappointments, disillusionment, sadness, sorrow, betrayal, it's all there. But if you build your life on that, you'll never walk free from it. You cut it loose. Learn to forgive. If you've done wrong, a word that's not preached anymore, repent. And if you repent and turn around, deal to it, You'll come into the bounty of God's provision and you'll walk in life. But what fills your heart? What's affecting your heart? What's troubling your mind? What's bringing perplexity? What is it that's motivating you? And most of us, sadly, are struggling with these issues. Finally, my brethren. Finally. It's a full stop. Here it is, the summation of it all. Like Ecclesiastes said, Fear God and obey his commandments. It's the summation of the whole matter. And you'll have peace in your soul. Whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, any praise, think on these things.